everybody. My name is Heather Jordan, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Mississippi State University. And I am talking to you today about why we should be conducting research on mycobacterium ulcerans and other non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. So this is continuing on uh, module number two. Uh, I've already talked to you a little bit um, about one reason why we should be conducting research on emulsorans, but now I'm going to uh, continue on. And again, uh, you've already uh, heard me say this, uh, hopefully, if you tuned in to the first one. Uh, this is a list of our collaborating institutions and our funding that is currently through the National Science Foundation, where any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations presented in this platform are those from me, the presenter, and not necessarily reflecting the views of the National Science Foundation. I mentioned last time that one of the reasons why we need to be researching mycobacterium ulcerans is because it causes a disease called Borrelia ulcer. And Borrelia ulcer is a skin disease that leads to high morbidity, including disability, disfigurement, economic burden, and social isolation and marginalization in many affected populations, particularly in rural West Africa. And the disease, as I mentioned, is a skin disease that leads to ulceration that can cover a great deal of the body. And ulceration is due to the production of a lipid molecule called mycolactone that is immunosuppressive and also causes the disease to be painless. Also, we know this much about emulsorans and Borrelia ulcer on um, this marginalization and, and uh, pathogenesis, but we don't know how emulsorans is transmitted to humans. It's associated with aquatic habitats, but we don't know how it's transmitted. What, what are those contact factors leading to transmission? Another reason why we need to be researching emulsorans is that heterogeneity in environmental and human samples suggests that some strains may be more likely to be transmitted to humans than others. So you're thinking about transmission and what we don't know about transmission. What we have found is that there are some strains that are in the environment that may be more likely to be transmitted to humans than others. And so I'll talk a little bit about the data, preliminary data we have, but first uh, I need to talk about the method we used, which is variable number of tandem repeat profiling. So this is a method that we use that takes advantage of the fact that there are different loci within a genome that contain tandem repeats. And one can create profiles from targeting multiple loci with these repeats, with different numbers of repeats, de determining the number of copies of the repeat sequence, which then can be used to discriminate between species and strains. And this is a method that's been proven useful in strain discrimination of, of mycobacteria, many different mycobacteria, including emulsorans. So we used variable number tandem repeat profiling to compare ulcerans and other mycolactam producing mycobacterial genotypes from human brulee ulcer cases and environmental samples. So there were swabs from patients who had Brulee ulcer, and swabs were taken from the Brulee ulcer wounds themselves. They were plated onto growth media and emulsorans grew up. So we took those emulsorans isolates and we isolated DNA from those. And then we went into the environments where Brule ulcer was endemic, so these aquatic habitats, uh, and we collected water and plants and invertebrates and soil and um, many different environmental samples, and we isolated DNA from those. And then we used this VNTR profiling. And what we found were that certain genotypes were more prevalent in environmental samples. So for instance, if you look at the red bars on this uh, top left figure here, um, this represents profile A. And 68% of environmental samples match profile A, whereas only 5% of the human samples match profile A. And then if you look at profile C, uh, for instance, and that's in the green bars, 74% of the human samples match profile C, whereas only 11% of our environmental samples DNA match profile C of emulsorans. And so what this suggests to us is that some strains may be more likely to be transmitted uh, or to produce pathology than others or to establish infection. And what I mean by that is that there could be some strains that are more likely to be just hanging out in the environment, these environmental persisters. Whereas if you have a person that goes into these aquatic habitats, there may be other strains that are more likely to be human colonizers. And this is really important to understand what strains are more likely to be uh, colonizers of humans than others. 
So we also use this profiling method from invertebrates, vertebrates, and plants, and we found a great deal of diversity in our different emulsorants profiles as well. So it just shows that there's a lot of diversity in the different uh, emulsorants species and strains. Now another interesting thing that has come about is that for a really long time it was thought that Emulsorans was the only mycobacterium to produce the toxin mycolactone, but other mycobacteria have been found to produce mycolactone. So Imlif landii was isolated from diseased West African frogs. Pseudoshotsii and mycolact mycolactone producing strains of emerinum have been isolated from diseased fish from the Mediterranean Red Seas, and, as well as the Chesapeake Bay. And all of these produce congeners of mycolactone with the same uh, invariant core structure but have differences in side chains. And you can see some of the different congeners of mycolactone and the fish and frog strains, Liflandii and Emsudoshatsii, that produce different mycolactones, produce mycolactone E and F. Now, it's not known whether these infect humans, although what, what we do know is that each mycolactone has been found to be cytotoxic to human cells. So mycolactone E and F, when uh, applied to human cells, has been shown to be cytotoxic. Another interesting thing that is not shown here, but uh, we published it in PLOS One in 2014, was that we found a BNTR genotype of emulsorans from a swab sample that was collected from a Brule ulcer patient. So again, one of those Brule ulcer wound swabs, plated onto a plate, it was culture negative. But when we isolated the DNA from that swab, it had a MPM, a mycolactone producing mycobacterial profile that matched one of these other profile. So it actually matched one for a mycolactone producing emerinum or pseudoshotsii a strain. So it was a profile that matched other than emulsorans. And so this is also important to understand because we don't know whether these other mycolactone producers are uh, infective to humans. And then finally, uh, on here, we targeted the intergenic regions between IS-2404 and IS-2606, and this is called 2426 PCR, against control DNA. And so we had a bunch of different isolates of ulcerans and all of these other mycolactone producers. And we used this method of PCR. And what we found were that some emulsorans positive environmental samples did not match known ulcerans profiles or other MPM profiles. And so what this shows to us is that there are some samples that don't match any known profiles at all, whether it be environmental, whether it be human isolates. What it shows is that, again, there's this great deal of diversity. So these preliminary data show emulsorans heterogeneity in environmental samples and uh, suggest that some strains may be more likely to be transmitted to humans or to establish an infection than others, and that ulcerans strains causing human disease are likely a subset of a broader MPM and potentially even non-tuberculosis mycobacterial diversity. So continuing research through molecular source tracking and strain typing will allow us to determine what the strain space is for emulsorans and other environmental pathogens, what's the best set of predictors for multiple strains and for patterns of coexistence, and how does coexistence vary between strains that cause occasional infection or no infection, and those responsible for pathogenic infection. So these will go a long way towards predicting infection and preventing exposure. All right, that is it for module number two. Thank you very much.